So it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Steve Mariotti uh, to deliver our Henry Hazlitt Memorial Lecture. This is actually the second time I've gotten the pleasure, had the pleasure of introducing you for a keynote speech. We had him at our campus a few years ago where he gave a terrific talk. Um, uh, Steve was named Social Entrepreneur of the Decade by the Industry Association of Top Professionals. Uh, he has written or co-authored over 40 books and manuals on entrepreneurship, ownership, and financial literacy, uh, of which there are an estimated 10 million copies in print. His recently published memoir called Good Goodbye Homeboy uh, is an Amazon uh, bestseller. It was uh, named the top educational nonfiction book in education for 2019. Uh, Steve Mariotti began his career as uh, at, at uh, Ford Motor Company in Detroit, where he was uh, part of the finance staff at the world headquarters in Dearborn. Uh, he was an international financial analyst. Uh, he left Ford and moved to New York City to found an import-export company called Mason Import and Export, which uh, uh, representative uh, over 20 overseas manufacturers, mostly from developing countries. In 1982, uh, he switched careers and became a special education teacher in New York City, in the South Bronx, where he specialized in enabling students who had dropped out of school to re-enter and take a class he developed entitled The Young Entrepreneur's Guide to Starting and Managing Your Own Small Business. And I don't know if some of you are like me, where I first heard of Steve Mariotti was from a fantastic segment in John Stossel's uh, uh, um, documentary series called Greed. You might remember Steve Mariotti as the inner city teacher who was reach, able to reach his students by teaching them about business. Um, so his course was a tremendous success um, and uh, encouraged by his success in reaching students, especially at-risk youth through teaching about business and entrepreneurship. He founded the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, or NIFTY as it's sometimes called, in 1988. Uh, 32 years later, NIFTY has over 1 million graduates from its mini MBA program and has become a global movement with over 12,000 trained teachers and programs in 10 countries and 17 American cities. So Steve Mariotti has received a number of awards, including the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, uh, the Bernard Goldhirsch Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award, uh, the New York Enterprise Report's 2012 Founders Award for Social Entrepreneurship, the National Director's Entrepreneurship Award from the Minority Business Development Agency of the U.S. Department of Commerce, and the Association of Education Publishers Golden Lamp Award uh, from, uh, uh, for the best curriculum in uh, U.S. education in 2002. Uh, Steve has attended the World Economic Forum for, for many years uh, and has co-authored the widely acclaimed paper, The Next Wave of Entrepreneurs, which guided uh, several uh, governments around the world in how to implement a youth entrepreneurship program uh, at the national level. Uh, he received his uh, BBA and MBA in finance from the University of Michigan. He's also studied at Harvard, Brooklyn College, Stanford, and Princeton. Uh, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and really one of the nation's best known spokespersons for entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship education. So it's a real pleasure to welcome you, Steve Mariotti, to the Mises Institute for the delivery of the Henry Hazlitt Memorial Lecture. So please join me in welcoming Steve Mariotti. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Oops. Hi. I was touched by your introduction, Peter. I've forgotten <laughs> all that. It was like I was looking. I was listening going, wow, I want to meet that guy. <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm somehow standing up. And Peter, you've been a great friend to me, so I really, really appreciate it. Um, I um, want to uh, tell you that I wanted to be an economist and very, very much. And I went to Michigan. It was a great school, very loyal. But within like a week, um, the head of the economics department called me and he said, you know, Steve, I don't think you're going to be very happy here because 
you're in the Austrian school, and I'd grown up in that school. My grandfather uh, was a um, Ayn Rand's lawyer and was great friends with Hayek, and so he was always sending me. Uh, the, in fact, the first book he sent me, now that I think about it, was Hazlitt's Economics in One Unit. That has to be one of the clearest written books ever, ever written. It took a, for me, it was like someone made something that was um, hard to learn. I was having trouble with economics. And it turned it into this incredible common sense made difficult, uh, but then made easy. And um, for that, for his contribution there, um, it's um, just enormous, I think. And so um, <laughs> this wonderful professor uh, said, you know, I don't think you're going to fit in here. And he was really nice about it. And he said, I'll walk you over. It was like high school. Remember, you get in trouble, and they walk you over somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'll walk you over and introduce you to Paul McCracken. He's more, he's not an Austrian, but he's a monetarist, and he'll be able to guide you better. So I think I was the only person in the history of the University of Michigan to be walked over by the head of the department to the business school where um, I found a home and uh, focused on international finance, which is something um, I was fascinated by and was totally, um, uh, it was totally apolitical. So I never bumped into uh, issues like, should there be price controls on housing in the South Bronx or something like that? And I spent six years there, and I had a great time. And then I was really wanted to get back into where I am right now with the Austrian uh, economics community. And in 77, at the Institute for Humane Studies, they had a summer program sponsored by the Liberty Fund where Hayek was actually going to be there. And he just won the Nobel Prize. And it, that was a big deal for me. And I fought and fought and wrote letters. I had people call. I was rejected for younger people here seven times. <laughs> because I'd never taken an economics class. And so they thought, you know, I wouldn't fit in. But I'd done all the reading and could cite human action. I knew money and banking. I knew socialism. I knew the papers Hayek had written in 1929 to 30, which he used to debate uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes in Cambridge in 31. Um, and so I was finally able, just through force of will, um, get into this program. <laughs> you can imagine what I was like, right? <laughs> I'm the only person I know that applauds themselves. But um, it, that three months, four months, actually, was there anybody else here that happened to be there that summer? It, it was the happiest. Um, it was actually, I'd have to say professionally, it was the happiest time of my, that I've ever had in my life. And um, uh, Don LaVoy, Larry White, uh, pretty much everybody that followed a traditional career path in economics was there. Mario Rizzo and uh, um, uh, Leonard Legio was head of it. And <laughs> I, I somehow got selected to um, pick up Hayek at the airport, and boy, that was a big deal. It was a random draw, and all my friends were mad, like going, how come Steve gets it, you know? And so I, there were two paragraphs in um, The Use of Knowledge in Society, which uh, Hayek had published on the, as a cover, American Economic Review, 1946. They're paragraphs 10 and 11, and they had fascinated fascinated me from when I first read them. My whole life I've been fascinated by those two paragraphs. 
They're the paragraphs that talk about unique knowledge of time and space. And coincidentally, that led to my whole future uh, career that I'll take great delight in um, telling you about in a moment and filling you in on all the awards that I won that Peter didn't mention. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I was, you know, got there two hours early. I was like, I was so happy to see uh, Professor Hayek. And as you can imagine, he was jet lagged and kind of tired. And I was doing the best I could not to talk, 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 but I couldn't help it. <laughs> and I had spent the two weeks previous learning those two paragraphs in German. And if you recall, Professor Hayek, credible hero of the last century, um, often wrote in his native language these long sentences that were very hard to translate and to some hard to understand. Um, I meant that as an, in a nice way. <laughs> but um, so I had spent memorizing how to say it in German so that he'd be feel welcome and he'd be impressed with me and I'd done a paper on the Austrian trade cycle theory. And it was, you know, I wanted to impress him. So he's um, kind of dozing off as I'm driving. And so <laughs> un unaware of anybody but myself, as usual, I start to um, talk in German uh, the best I could and, and re recite those two paragraphs. And poor Professor Hayek kind of comes to and he goes, oh, do you speak German? I say, no, but I memorized my favorite two paragraphs in your uh, literature that you've written. And, and, he, <laughs> and he goes, what are those? And so I, I said, I can't even imagine I did this. I said, see if you can tell. And continue. <laughs> 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 Ooh. Wait till you see what else I've got in store for you today. <laughs> and um, from that, he, he was very um, kind to me. And I never forgot his kindness. He'd always say, you know, he'd always say, hello, Steve. And then he'd say in German, the first sentence of paragraph 10. It was our, our little code. And, you know, all my friends would go, God, how does Steve know? Hayek, and they're talking in German. <laughs> and I'd, I'd be like this. <laughs> so it's, it's one of the great memories of my life. So as life would have it, um, I very much wanted to um, get a PhD in economics. And I had an acquaintanceship with Professor Friedman, another remarkably um, wonderful person. You know, I found that the better someone does often in their career, the kinder they are because they don't have, uh, I'm not sure what it is, um, they're, they don't have a, any chip at all. So they want you to do well. And Professor Friedman was so kind to me. And he said, he said, Steve, are you sure that you want to come here at the University of Chicago? You know, you're gonna be doing math for four or five years, and I know you well enough to know I'd been his bag carrier at the Mount Pelerin Institute in 74 at Hillsdale College, and uh, would talk constantly to him. And he, he, he would always listen, listen, listen. He was just a wonderful man. And he goes, I know you well enough to know that you're not gonna sit still long enough to do the math. And that word of advice was, went right into my subconscious and I realized he was right. And so I, my life went in a different direction and I went to Ford Motor Company where I was a financial analyst for three years and um, in the International Finance Department and uh, just had a magnificent time there and learned a ton. Uh, but after three years of it, I realized I wasn't going to ever be comfortable in a hierarchy 
um, a corporate hierarchy or really any hierarchy. And it, it comes back later that I want to talk about it. It was a source of strength to me, the concept of subjective value, which really to me is a lesson in uh, uh, passed down in the Austrian tradition, which the brilliance of it by Menger and a Walrus and the third guy, I always forget, all in the same year, I believe 1864, uh, uh, I believe, that they all had this insight that value is subjective. And that insight, when once I you know, was able to integrate it, it has been so helpful to me in my life because I was able to get myself out of a hierarchy and realize that I wasn't going to be happy in a hierarchy because I viewed, I would always have a different viewpoint. And so I had the courage to leave Ford and uh, they overpay you there and it's very hard to leave because it's such a great place to work. Um, and, and, and moved to New York City and I, started a business that Professor Klein was kind enough to mention. And I just loved that. It was basically every day I'd go on sales calls and help um, somebody with a manufacturing firm in a third world country sell their product. I had no competition. And after a year, all of a sudden I started to make money on top of it. And it was, a, you know, just a miracle. And then... Out of the blue, I'm in the FDR Park in New York City with my, um, uh, um, I thought she was my girlfriend. She didn't think I, I was <laughs> her boyfriend, let's put it that way. <laughs> but a young woman that I really admired. And we're walking along, and it's uh, daylight, and there's two or 300 uh, people there playing soccer, softball. It's a great part of New York. And with no warning at all, I, I should say we got attacked, but it ended up really, I got attacked by like three or four uh, young kids who, um, you know, were smaller than I was. I'd forgotten how to fight, you know, from Flint and kind of when I was a kid would pretend to fight, you know. But they uh, pushed me down and um, I cried. And it was really uh, humiliating to... It wouldn't bother me now at all. You could beat me up or push me around now. I want to. I'd go ah, you know. But back then, in front of a friend that I really wanted to impress, it was really painful. Particularly when she went stop it, and they all froze. Go away, and they ran away. And as they're leaving, <laughs> she pretends to. Uh, kick one of them, and like a movie scene, he falls down. She doesn't even kick him, gets up, runs away. And so she was the hero, and I was kind of the person that she'd rescued. And that was a, a it seems minor now, I, I think of it, and I go, how could, you, how could you be so bothered by that? But I was, and I had constant um, flashbacks, um, which is, is called post-traumatic stress disorder. I would not wish that on my worst enemy. Um, uh, it was like really, really painful. And at that time in my life, I had this unique relationship with, with Ayn Rand, who my uh, grandfather was the lawyer for her. And I would get to see her every four months for 15 minutes, but because I had learned to be real quiet with her, it would turn into five hours because she would talk and I never interrupt. <laughs> and, and she kind of liked that. And so, <laughs> and so it, it was like, uh, a great relationship. And um, but, but that was the rule. I'd say, hello, goodbye, boom. <laughs> and uh, what a hero when you think of it. There's another hero which she went through and the legacy with, with all of her shortcomings and uh, foibles that we all have, 
uh, but another um, a real hero um, in standing up against tyranny. Um, so um, he, at the last time I met with her was in December of 81, which was right before she gave her last talk in uh, New Orleans for uh, Jim Blanchard's um, community. And she noticed that I was distracted, <laughs> like you can't notice now, you know, uh, and, and that I was kind of talking to myself, which are symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And I didn't know anything about that. And she goes, what's wrong with you? You're not listening to me. And I go, no, I'm listening total. I'm totally focused on listening. No, you're not. No, I am, Mr. Rand. <laughs> Imagine debating Ayn Rand on that topic while you're listening. <laughs> and so, um, much to her credit, you know, and a lot of the literature paints her as this cold, distant person, but I, I didn't, I was afraid of her, but I never felt she didn't care. And on a Sunday afternoon, she called her friend enemy, is how she referred to him, Albert Ellis, who um, was a great psychologist. Um, you'll remember him from um, You Can Change How You Feel by Changing How You Think, uh, which is standard practice now. And he, uh, she said, I have a friend, she called me a friend, I couldn't believe it, that it has, I think it's um, some kind of trauma. This is after the mugging. And I want you to see him. And I could hear him saying, I can't see him. You know, it's a Sunday, blah, blah, blah. And I was so embarrassed, you know. And <laughs> she made him see me. So it was like, you know, I felt like, uh, well, I obeyed her, let's put it that way. So I went over to 65th Street in Lexington where he had this big um, home, beautiful home. And he came down, he was um, uh, grumpy, but he was always like that, I found out later. And <laughs> he took me um, with a graduate student who he called up on Sunday made the poor person come over. And, he's, and he goes, now what is bothering you? And so after 20 minutes, I finally was able to say, uh, I feel humiliated because I got pushed around in front of my girlfriend. I put quotation marks around it. He goes, he takes a picture of it. He said, I'll show you this picture in six months. And now you're going to change the sentence to a positive sentence. And that took a while. And he pretended to guide me a little bit. But I finally got there, and I changed it to, I am a hero because uh, without any violence, my friend and I were able to um, stand up to uh, young people that were trying to hurt us or something like that. But I became the hero of the sentence. Then, and so all, immediately I felt better. It was like a miracle. And then he goes, hey, yeah, now you're going to write it 500 times. <laughs> I thought he was kidding. You know, that's like funny to me. So I go, <laughs> You know, but he met it, and the poor graduate student, who I'm still acquaintance as well, I'm friends with now, actually, he had to sit there and watch me write it, but let me off after about 200. And I go home, next morning I wake up, and it's this uh, pain that I was having, mem constant memories of one event, um, was gone. And I was so happy, I couldn't tell you. And so I call the secretary and I say, I want to come up and uh, say thank you to Professor Ellis. And um, uh, she puts me on the uh, appointment schedule or something. So I go up there, I walk in, I have a gift and, you know, Professor uh, or Ellis, don't call me that, Albert, uh, I mean Albert. Uh, I wanted to tell you how, oh, would you, you're not done. And so he takes me into his office, same graduate student, 
And he goes, all you've done is gotten a reprieve from these, um, uh, he used some word, gobble gooplin or something, that's gotten in your mind. You're just starting your recovery. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm really, I'm fine. He goes, no, you have to do what's called flooding. Um, anybody remember that from reading Alice? I love it when I'm the oldest guy in the room. Yes, I've made it. <laughs> so flooding is where you relive a, anything you're afraid of. You do over and over again. So if you're afraid of an elevator, you write, write it up over and over again. If you're afraid of playing baseball or going in the water, you just do it over and over again. And it really does make a huge difference. So he said, uh, now you're going to go be a teacher in schools that are, um, he was the first person I ever heard use this word, under-resourced, which is a very common phrase now. He used that in 82. And I said, I can't do that. I have a small business. And he was like really aggressive. He said, if you don't do it, I'm going to call Ayn Rand. And I go, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> Um, I, and so I went to um, uh, Boys and Girls High School, and uh, a friend of mine, um, Ray uh, LaBeouf, was the um, um, a director of placement in the New York City schools. And so it was kind of relatively easy for me after three weeks to get a placement in a, a school where nobody would go. Like 79 teachers had been assigned there. And not one of them would, would, they refused to go. And so I was thinking, the way I had a plan, I would go for like, you know, two or three days, um, meet my requirement with Professor Ellis, not get in trouble with Miss Rand or my grandfather. So I had it all planned. And I walked in, and I hope this happens to all of you, but it was... The minute I walked in, I knew I'd found my life's work. Like really, within 10 or 15 minutes, I felt like I could really add value to something. Um, and in, oh. <laughs> I hope that applause was meant for me and not some. <laughs> um, so, I then spent um, really the rest of my life in this field, and I, there was one point after about three or four months, which was seminal, and it almost drove me to leave, but I'll tell you quickly what happened. I was assigned the um, uh, kids that, they're called special ed children to me, they're a special gift from God, they really are. and. They, but when you're looking at their behavior, sometimes it's excessive, so they're defined a certain way. Or when you're looking at their learning style, they learn uniquely. But if you can get under that, they, they all have special gifts. And it, it was a very beautiful thing, learning that for me. But one day, I'm in class, and I lost control of the class. And that happens a lot, there's nothing to be ashamed of. But it was particularly brutal that day because the, the class was what was called overloaded, which, which means there was 30 kids in it and there was supposed to be 12. And it wasn't, it was a programming error. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're so uncomfortable that you can't, you can barely stand it. Anybody ever been there? Don't all raise your hands at once, right? <laughs> we all have, right? So I went outside the door, and I literally um, prayed. I said, God, let me find a way to um, teach something today of value. And I remember I looked down, and I had a, a regular inexpensive watch on, and I walked back in, and I said, you know, it was like, 
the noise was overwhelming. But I waved the watch and I went, how much would you pay for this? And the class went totally cold, stone, uh, silent. And everybody was looking at me, kind of like now. <laughs> and I said again, how much would you pay for this? And suddenly it was like a seminar at what I'd always imagined a great, a great a graduate school would be like. And not only were they throwing out different prices, but then they were debating amongst themselves, questioning whether the $10 was too high or too low. And right then, I, 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 that became my life's work within my life's work, which was teaching about business to um, uh, low-income children who through no fault of their own, this is the uh, tragedy of this to me, and also an opportunity, no fault of their own, had never been exposed to something they were really interested in, which was money. I, I happen to be somebody who loves money, talking about it, making it. I really appreciated the stipend. Uh, when I, They gave it to me, knowing me, when I walked in. It was the first thing, I was like totally happy. So, <laughs> um, and uh, so, um, I began to focus on that one issue. And for the next seven years, eight years actually, I basically worked on uh, books for kids on how to start small businesses. And this was, this is the latest version actually, now that I'm looking at it, but that is probably the 40th edition. And I update it every six months. I self-publish and, um, I just um, would produce all this literature that didn't exist aimed at children who had gotten behind on their reading or had a problem with mathematics and were unique learners. And instead of uh, pushing them away or giving them a grade, I would uh, enhance them. And that was the other time of subjective value came in to my life uh, really vividly is I began to talk about subjective value. And it was like lifting a weight off their, off these children's shoulders because they had been taught, as most of us are, that what's your SAT score? Are you going to go to school here or there? Are you uh, starting on the basketball team and blah, blah, blah. And for me, a, the ability to talk about that your viewpoint is of value as an individual and that you have the right to have a different viewpoint is often never said to children that um, are, are, at the, are defined by society at the bottom of a situation. And it was liberating for them and for me to be able to share that. And all that came from Menger and the Austrian tradition. And um, so I, I wanted to say thank you uh, to, um, uh, for that insight. And I can't tell you how happy I am to be here today. I mean, it's like my, my heart is going really fast. It's just such an honor. Um, I, so eight years goes by and um, I'll now turn to uh, Jessica, and I'll play the, Jessica, I'm sorry, we'll play the uh, ABC News piece, and this will bring you up to date, and then I'll talk some more. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Tonight we begin our report on the American agenda with a rhetorical question. Can one person really make a difference? The issue tonight is drugs. Specifically the fact that thousands of inner city kids are drawn into the drug business because, well, because it's a very easy way to make money. Tonight's report tends to emphasize one of the things we've noticed about many of the issues on the agenda. Quite often the solution to a problem is not a grand one. Here's Beth Nissen. 
buy hot dogs. People, come on. I'm proud of this of this business because I don't have to be afraid. You know what I'm saying? The cops aren't after me. I don't owe anybody money. This is my own little business. Meet Howard Stubbs, high school senior, company president. He owns Howard's Hot Dogs. Every weekend, he works this corner in the South Bronx. Last year, he grossed $10,000. Don't sell things you don't believe in. Steve Mariotti is the man Howard credits for most of his success. Two years ago, this high school business teacher had an idea. Give inner city kids better job skills and build their self-esteem by helping them start their own companies. Mariotti quickly found that many were business naturals. It's got something to do with street smarts, that if these children can make it to the age of 17 and they're alive and they're not defeated mentally, they're, they're heroes and they have the mental strength to start a company. The bottoms come in small because they run pretty big, okay? And the top comes small, medium, and large. Okay. In Mariotti's program, okay. Josephine Renault devised a business plan for her lingerie company. She learned how to select her stock, display it, price it, how to keep the books and reinvest the profits. When I used to get my little allowance, I used to just spend it, but now mm -hmm. I, know, I'm, I know to use some money. For the year, so far I made up 10,000. You're 19 years old. Right. What other kind of work would have been able to provide that kind of profit for you? What, what else could you have done to make Drugs. <laughs> Drugs. All right, listen. Me and God the bomb gonna show you how it sound. Need no drugs alone, I'm gonna tell you now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I got a little messed up, I messed up. Messing up is what 18-year-old Vincent Wilkins says he was doing two years ago, working for a drug dealer, hardly going to school. He was a sullen student in Mariotti's class, until Mariotti encouraged him to write and record rap songs. What would you have been now if it weren't for this program? So I would have been a big-time drug dealer right now. I was. For many who live in Vincent's neighborhood, the drug business is where the best job opportunities are, and the only entry-level jobs that pay more than fast food wages. You don't need special training. Vincent was paid for just standing on this corner. They tell you, hey man, you know, you want to make a little money? Just watch the corner, you get paid $200 like that. And that make you bug out how fast I made that money, you know? I can make more. You know, the drug industry has trained, I hate to say it, but a whole generation of inner city kids in the area of, of distribution and sales. You organized on your stuff? Yes. Okay. For Mariotti's students, this is the first step into legitimate business, a trip to a wholesaler's with $100 each to spend on merchandise. Mariotti used to pay out of his own pocket. He now gets some money from corporate sponsors who have invested in more than 50 little company presidents like Ray Taboo. All right, I bought these for 350 each, right? And then I'm going to sell them for 10. Mm -hmm. How long have you had this company of yours? Um, about five hours. Five hours. In my opinion, they see themselves uh, at the bottom of the hierarchy. Getting a kid his business cards, making him president of his own company, all of a sudden he comes out of that hierarchy. He's no longer on the bottom rung. Josephine says the program has given her a sense of purpose. Now I have a whole lot of plans. I want to open my shop. I want to go to college. Howard already has a four-year scholarship starting next year. And Vincent? He wants to be a star and inspire other young artists. These days, he is trafficking only in dreams. Beth Nissen, ABC News, The South Bronx. What sort of a difference can one person make? In the past three years, those 50 businesses that Steve Mariotti has helped youngsters to start have earned more than $80,000. No, it's not as much money as drugs, perhaps, but at least they earn it the old-fashioned way. Peter Jennings. We mark the first anniversary of the American agenda on this broadcast. We're going to revisit some people who were the focus of one of our very first reports. A teacher who wanted to help kids turn away from a world filled with drugs, and the kids themselves, who had the guts to reach for a different dream. The idea was a fairly simple one, help a youngster start a legitimate business as a way to resist the temptation of selling drugs. But would it work? Here's Beth Nissen. This was Howard Stubbs a year ago. 
a high school senior making $10,000 a year selling hot dogs on the weekends, and dreaming of someday making it out of the South Bronx, someday owning his own restaurant. Chef, can I ask a question? Does it matter, does it matter what type of cheese you use? You this is Howard Stubbs today, a freshman at Johnson & Wales University, a four-star school for culinary arts. The university was so impressed by this young entrepreneur that it awarded him a generous scholarship. But for Howard, college was a step higher than he thought he could take. I felt kind of inferior. I was like, well, you know, I'm different. I thought that I couldn't handle it. Then he realized that mastering new concepts, establishing new territory, was what he'd done in running his own business. I finally said to myself, I said, hey, if I can do that, I can stay in this college and I can be the best. Howard, how, how you doing? Steve Mariotti has worked hard to convince students like Howard that they have a place in the mainstream economy. Last year, his entrepreneurial program helped a dozen teenagers start their own businesses. This year, an expanded staff is advising 30 young business owners. The idea? Help kids resist entry-level jobs in the drug industry. You have to offer alternatives other than just minimum wage jobs. You have to give a child a vision, and entrepreneurship does that. The bottoms come in small because they run pretty big, okay? And the top comes small, medium, and large. This was Josephine Renault last November, working flea markets selling lingerie. A few months ago, she moved to Los Angeles and landed a job as a bank teller. How would you like your money? When Josephine entered Mariotti's program, she could not add or subtract. Running her own business taught her to balance the books. This is 20, 40, 60, 70. It gave me a lot of encouragement and a lot of experience. I think if it wasn't for Steve um, teaching me math, I wouldn't be a bank teller. Like many graduates of the entrepreneurship program, Josephine has let her business slip. Mariotti is not disappointed. Whether a kid builds up a Ford Motor Company or a major company, or even if he goes into business, doesn't matter to me, as long as it's had a positive effect on his, uh, on his thinking. I was doing the drug way, that's the wrong way of life, but when you're living in the ghetto, it's hard, you gotta fight. This is about where we left Vincent Wilkins a year ago. Vincent had been working in the drug business as a courier until Mariotti convinced him to work instead on recording his own rap songs. He stayed out of the drug industry now for two and a half years. Uh, you know, it's very easy to get addicted to that industry from a business point of view. He has not done that. To Mariotti, that counts as one tiny victory in the drug war, although he worries that Vincent sabotaged himself when he dropped out of high school last spring. Vincent now spends his days recording others in his cramped bedroom studio on equipment bought with a loan from Mariotti's program. He charges clients $40 an hour, a fraction of what he made on the streets. Your friends once were still involved with drugs. Mm -hmm. What do they think of your business and what you're doing now? They think I'm a fool, man. So far, Vincent has tuned them out. But even young children hear about street profits, and Mariotti wants them to learn his brand of economics first. Money. You gave him money. And what did he give you in return? Change. He is trying to recruit them before the drug dealers do. He has brought his program to grade school. A laundromat, very good. Is that an example of a business? Yes. And who, own, who would own that? An entrepreneur. Beautiful, I'm proud of you. Mariotti says anyone can learn to be an entrepreneur, and anyone can start a program like his. What it takes are large reserves of energy, an eagerness to extend credit, and a gift for nourishing all that has value. Beth Nissen, ABC News, The South Bronx, New York. I just want to say hi to uh, Vincent and Serena, who are watching, I hope. <laughs> um, those were two of the young people that uh, were in that film. I forgot, I hadn't watched that in a while, but it was, uh, very emotional for me to see that. Um, so, uh, can we go to the NFT page? And uh, so, I, I wanted to show you this out of that um, media. Um, I was able to raise enough money to found a Nifty in um, 
right after the first Peter Jennings piece, actually, I would go around with the a tape and show uh, wealthy entrepreneurs or business people or foundation people in New York City, and um, and then I'd write letters to the Forbes 500 and um, uh, Forbes 400, and finally this wonderful man, Ray Chambers, in Morristown, New Jersey, said, "Well, how much do you need to found this?" And I, I said. And he did me a great service. He goes, how about 600,000, 200,000 a year for three years? I was going to ask for 25,000. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of sensed that, you know? And uh, so thanks to him and, and then tens of thousands of other people, this is argu has become arguably the most successful uh, youth program for um, uh, young people as far as replication is concerned. This is actually now in 17 countries. We have a million 100,000 graduates. And guess where our largest program is as far as graduates this year? I won't, and I won't mock you if you're wrong. I'll call on Steve. Uh, China, you're right, Steve, very good. <laughs> It, it, China has, this year, um, will graduate more um, uh, uh, young people from our program than any other um, country in the world. And I'm always like amazed by that, um, as I, the juxtaposition between a communist um, government, which is really the opposite of, at least how I perceive uh, humanity, that of individual liberty and the importance of the of the individual with God-given rights that can never be taken away. And as I understand from reading Dust Capital and Communist Manifesto and, and Lenin and um, Trotsky, who was, was actually the one who came up with the technique of how to take over a, a democracy. Uh, in his 1935 paper, The Left Turn, which all of you should read, um, I, I, don't, I can't reconcile that. But it's a sign of hope to me that we will be able to get differences worked out and without giving up our core values or engaging in a, a disastrous exchange of, of violence. So uh, I urge you to go to the site if you'd like to. It's NFT. Dot com. It's a charity, and um, I'm really it's uh, the culmination of of um, what I'd like to be remembered for. Um, after working there um, as the president and the, the founder of the um, uh, fundraiser, also uh, I went part time and. Um, it's been a real blessing for me because it's opened up all of these wonderful worlds that I've gotten to experience. Um, if you want to go to the next page, that'd be great. First of all, I started a, a business with this young man, Michael Bees, in, uh, who lives in um, South Carolina. And he is arguably the top... Um, it's, marketing person, consultant, you know, at least in this country, there was nobody close to him. And I heard about him because I was going to write my memoirs, uh, Goodbye Homeboy, and I never had a bestseller because all, all the books that I'd written had been like textbooks or manuals, and it, it's just not something that the general public would buy. So I wanted to really put, see if I could do it, and learn how to create something that millions of people would buy or be interested in. And so I was living in New York City for 40 years, um, and I asked uh, my friends who had New York Times bestsellers how they got so successful in the marketplace, and I asked 10 of them, and three of them mentioned the same young man, um, Michael Beese, and so I called him, and uh, he came up to where I live now, Princeton, and 
we got to know each other, and then I went down there, and he's got a beautiful family. And we decided to create a publishing firm for people that can't find a publisher. Anybody ever been there? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's hard, right? And it's, I don't think it's fair. It, it's usually based on the influence your agent has. And if you don't have an agent and you don't live in a New York City or one of the major um, urban areas, you don't meet agents. So this was created to help authors that can't find a publisher. So we publish, and then thanks to Michael's, you know, lifelong or uh, over a decade study of the field, he's able to, I should say we're able to, it's really him, uh, market a book and guarantee that it be on um, number one on Amazon in your category. I never even knew there were all these different categories in Amazon. And that's just with the ebook, by the way. But so you take someone who's never had an opportunity to publish, you publish their book, you give them the files back so that you're not um, holding them back. They can go anywhere they want. And you, you teach them how to market it so that it becomes a number one Amazon bestseller in their category. And that can be life changing. And it's been a great joy being a, a small part of that. Um, and then from out of this, or simultaneously, I guess, um, I began to, I, I was in Cambodia on a lecture tour, and I read all about, literally almost everything written about the uh, Holocaust genocide that went on there. And, Three million people out of eight million were killed in 27 months um, without the use of bullets. Can you imagine? I mean, so I'd read all that and studied it and would, was trying to analyze it and understand it. And so it would never happen again. And there's almost no research on that, on Cambodia. And so the State Department heard about all this research I was doing and trying to understand it. And my buddy there called me and said, do you want to go there and give a series of lectures on small business? I said, oh boy, I'd love to. So I, everything I knew once I got there, and then each, each lecture I'd go in and it would be almost all women. And I would say, where are the men? Each time, it was so shocking to me that I had to relearn it. And they go, well, you know, in this generation, they were, you know, pretty much all um, killed. And I go, what? And because my mind was pushing it away into my subconscious, I think, or something. But it was that that um, uh, troubling to me. And from this, I was invited to Hanoi, which was another surreal experience. <laughs> meeting with the leaders in uh, you know, Hanoi, which my generation had been taught, were um, uh, you know, um, very against American values. And getting a different perspective, um, you know, Hanoi, or Vietnam in general, has the highest rate of business formation uh, in the world. And their marginal tax is 10%. And I remember sitting with their uh, uh, leaders and all, and you know they say, "Well, Mr. Mariotti, we brought you here because we'd like your advice on creation of small business." And I get all motivated, you know, to talk five hours or whatever. And I start, "Well, we've got to get your tax code right first. And they go, "They're all taking notes. They go, "What should we do?" And I say, "Well, I'd recommend a 10 percent flat, flat tax. Do you think you could?" Do that, and they they bring out their tax code, show it to me, and it's ten percent flat, and poor people pay zero, and I literally almost fell over. I go, where? Did, how did you hear about that? You know, and they go, well, we were watching the presidential uh, debates, and that guy Steve Forbes had had recommended that. So the next day we went out. <laughs> I mean, it was just unbelievable to me. 
And um, I, I also learned other things that were actually painful. I'll quickly tell you one quick thing. And that I, my generation was taught that Ho Chi Minh was this uh, person that was against freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press. And, you know, I don't know if that's true anymore. I, I went to this museum where um, very few non-Vietnamese um, are taken. It's a big honor to me. And I walk in, and the first thing I see, they have the guillotine there where they actually beheaded you know, anybody that was a revolutionary when the French ran, were colonialists of Vietnam. And I see that, and then I turn, and there is um, a quote from a name that I knew, who was Ho Chi Minh's partner in the original uprising, which I think was 1922. And so he, uh, this guy, Su, C-U, and Ho Chi Minh had led the uh, revolt against the, the French. Um, and here's, the French would always, before you're beheaded, uh, give you a last um, word, right? And and it goes back to the um, um, 1793. Um, and he, uh, so they gave this gentleman, CU, who had been captured, the, his last words. And th this is what they were to the best of my memory. It was, <clears throat> you kill me today because you claim I'm a communist. In reality, it's because I revolt against your high taxes, forced purchase of government debt, all of which, the proceeds, all of which you send back to make your own country wealthy. And it, the more research I did on it, at least with Ho Chi Minh and Su, they would be like a Barry Goldwater, which, you know, it was kind of hard for me to adjust to that that insight, and I think that that's, that's accurate, tragically. And there were other reasons for our, our involvement there, which I think are maybe, if true, are heartbreaking. So I'll move on from here. Um, so this was, oh, um, before we show it, right? Thank, thanks, Jessica, I appreciate that, and Clay. Um, so from that, experience in Cambodia and, and a subsequent Vietnam, I came back and I was, I was debriefing with the State Department and trying to give my recommendations or something. And I didn't really, I realized, I didn't really know what to say. Like, how do you prevent a, a genocide or a Holocaust or just this incredible tragedy? And um, so, uh, that was eight years ago, and I set off to create a documentary film and with these wonderful filmmakers, uh, Harold and Nan Klein, who really are the heroes here. I just raised the money, um, and, but we finished, and I want to show you uh, the trailer, uh, the film, the documentary, it will speak for itself. I'll just show you the trailer. We had a very tragic incident in our family dealing with uh, race. It was, very, it was a very traumatizing and a time in our house because we needed the money. Then the doctor called and when she delivered me the news that, you know, I had cancer, I thought the world was done with me. I thought that I would die. And I was with one of the hospital corpsmen, opened it up. And from the floor to the ceiling were body bags. They were on my platoon. They load us up on a train. Easy, 150 people. We start asking in Polish where they taken us. So the people made like this. I ended up in waking up bleeding 
I knew something horrible had happened. He raped me. He raped me. You don't know if you're going to be lucky and survive or if you're going to die. The pack thing, close to 3,000 people in the point of my life. I was telling my son, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm dying. And I go to the doctor and the doctor says, you're pregnant. Everyone told me that it would ruin my life, that I wouldn't have a future. A physical wound you can deal with. A mental wound is like a knife, it's always cutting. I wouldn't be here today, I would have probably have drank myself to death. And I thought, well, I'll build a casket. And I said, I'll leave, I quit. The same day, I started a business. I ended up moving into my radio station and sleeping on the floor for 18 months in a sleeping bag. I am going to build a medical practice. Everybody thought I was completely insane. I think when somebody is faced with tragedy in their life, you have two options. You can lay down and take it, or you can stand up and you can fight back. That's what an entrepreneur does. It's not about a business, it's about a, a state of mind. You are a victim until there is a change and you become a survivor. If you want to grow, you have to be uncomfortable. There is no way that if you're comfortable, you are growing. I don't have to worry about post-traumatic stress. It's just me and what that wood is telling me to do. I believe that my mission in life has been to uplift and motivate my community. If cancer prepared me to start my own business and run my own business, then heck yeah, I'm gonna have to go for it. Well, I lost my family, and if my family would be here, they would be very proud. I represent the six million. It is scary, but when you come from such a trauma, not much is scary anymore. So, uh, thank you. So, the th I'll wrap up now, but the thought that has came out of this like eight year uh, um, adventure in finding people that had, had lived through these traumas, these horrible, uh, events and then not only survived but also turned their life into this great success. Every, every, every life is a great success if you, you know, you, that's self-determined. But all over the world, I would, we'd find these people, film them, and w what I think is a huge question for the academic community, particularly the, um, uh, uh, using uh, methodological individualism, um, uh, praxology, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm showing off Peter, I apologize, <laughs> but is to, um, it, this question, whenever there is, <clears throat> excuse me, violent conflict between uh, governments, right, no one ever asks what is the entrepreneur doing? Like it becomes, and, with, and I'm not totally objective here, but time periods of history will become about Churchill, um, uh, Hitler, uh, Stalin, Roosevelt, you know, those names, Patton, et cetera. No judgment at all. But no one knows what's happening to the billion entrepreneurs around the world. And I've, I've, it left me with this thought. If those people were empowered um, in to impact what uh, was going to happen as far as these conflicts, they might be able to stop it. And I find it really interesting when you engage in a conversation with almost any government entity anywhere in the world that the entrepreneur never enters the conversation. You have to bring it up and talk about it and Politically, it never enters the conversation. This huge community of people that are not, are almost never violent, or professionally are almost are never violent. And I think it's a question that um, uh, needs to be discussed more, and that a lot of good will come from talking about it, filming it, thinking about it, and engaging in a broader debate. 
I'm so happy to be here today. I really appreciate it. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.